Welcome to Ideas on Tap, presented by the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. I'm Lauren, and I'd like to start this evening by recognizing that the museum and the University of Oregon are located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. And they continue to make important contributions to their communities, to the museum and to the university, to Oregon and to the world. We express our respect to the many more tribes who have ancestral connections to this territory, as well as to all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. I wanna thank everyone who's joining us on such a lovely evening. Although we might not be together in person, we do still wanna hear your questions and your comments. During this evening's program, you can use the Q&A and chat features on Zoom and Facebook to reflect on the talk or add your thoughts, to engage with other viewers and to ask questions of our speaker. I'll be collecting your questions across both platforms and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. During the talk, we'll post a link to a brief survey in the comments on both Zoom and Facebook. Please consider taking a minute or two to fill it out, even if you've already filled it out before. Your feedback will help us improve future virtual programs, and you'll be entered to win a $25 gift card to Viking Bracket Company, where the museum hosted our Ideas on Tap program prior to the pandemic. If you enjoy tonight's program, we're asking that you please consider making a secure, tax-deductible donation at the web address listed on the screen to help keep museum programs like this one accessible to all. That's giving.uoregon.edu slash mnchgift. Your donation directly supports the museum's educational programming, bringing science and culture adventures to Oregonians of every age and in every corner of the state. Thank you. Tonight's talk wraps up the museum's 2021 to 2022 season of Ideas on Tap. Although Ideas on Tap is taking a break for the summer, the museum still has plenty of other programs to keep you busy. First up, a reminder that you only have a few weeks left to see PhotoArc, a traveling exhibit from National Geographic. You'll come face to face with some of the world's most charismatic animals through stunning photography by Joel Sartor. PhotoArc is on display through May 29th, so don't miss it. The museum is open Wednesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. and until 8 p.m. on Thursdays. We're also free on the first Friday of each month, so this Friday would be a great time to visit and check out PhotoArc and our other amazing exhibits. In-person talks continue this spring at the museum. Next week on Thursday, May 12th, join botanist and Oregon Flora Director Linda Hardison to discover the why and where of plant diversity in our state. Then the following Thursday, May 19th, join MNCH archeologists for a glimpse into how a Chinese American owned business successfully operated in downtown Eugene in the early 20th century admits, admits racist laws and a predominantly Euro American community. This talk is co-sponsored by the Oregon Historical Society. Both of our upcoming Thursday evening talks are included with admission. Seating is limited and pre-registration is encouraged. Registration opened today, so be sure to visit our website and secure your seat. On Saturday, May 21st, the Emerald Chapter of the Native Plant Society of Oregon partners with the MNCH for a native plant tour in and around the museum's Glen Starlin Native Plant Courtyard. The tour begins at 1 p.m., rain or shine, and is included with admission. Finally, on Wednesday, June 8th, join us for a special reopening celebration of natural athletes, track and field champs of the animal kingdom. 
First opened in March of 2020, but interrupted by the pandemic, we're excited to bring the exhibit back before this summer's World Athletic Championships, Oregon 22. You can learn more about all of our upcoming and um, current spring programs by visiting our website, mnch.uoregon.edu. And now it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Kimberly Johnson. Kimberly grew up in Eugene, where she developed an early interest in social justice and got involved with the NAACP youth chapter. Kimberly is currently the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and Student Success at the University of Oregon. In addition to her official role, she regularly engages with UO students as a mentor to Black student leaders, as a graduate advisor, and as an alumni advisor to Alpha Kappa Alpha, and historically black sorority. She is also the author of This Is My America, her debut novel that explores racial injustice against innocent black men who are criminally sentenced and the families left behind to pick up the pieces. She joins us this evening for a discussion on literary activism and expanding silenced voices. Welcome Kimberly. Thank you so much. You know, it was so wonderful just to hear all of the different activities that um, are happening at the museum. And I have, I was like trying to recall every date, the Thursday, the first Friday. So there's so much incredible things happening over there. And I'm really, really appreciative um, for all of the support to be here today for Ideas on Tap, um, Lauren and Becky and all the coordination and communication involved um, to it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to ha really having a conversation, even though you all are, at, you know, on Facebook and Zoom. Um, but I'm hoping that while I'm talking, you're talking back to me and really looking forward to uh, the question time period to ask questions. Um, you know, I have shared, you know, in other settings uh, about how my journey of being a writer was something that I never really expected um, to talk about. Um, I never really expected that, you know, those late evenings and weekends where I was writing that um, the community, my larger community locally and um, around the country would be in conversation with things that are so seminal to my novel. So I'm really excited to be here um, with you all. And um, having been a, a debut release that um, debuted during the pandemic, right at the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement, I also never really expected how, um, how prominent these issues would be on other people's radars. These are things I care about, but weren't things necessarily that I felt the broader larger community that weren't um, directly impacted or um, adjacently impacted were paying attention to. And so I really was a, you know, a, a writer, and I was Kim Johnson, the, the writer who kept those things secret for my professional life. And then I was a professional who was who known as the vice provost. And I kept those identities very separate. And after my release, and more people have read my book and my work and, and know, uh, know that I've, I've written this work and hear about the um, the TV series adaption that's occurring, um, then there's but that word blurred for me a lot. Um, but for the purposes of this um, time that we're sharing today, I, I'm not going to try to blur those worlds. I want to make it very clear <laughs> that any of you opinions or viewpoints expressed by mine alone are not official positions of the University of Oregon. This is Kim Johnson, the author, here with you to talk about literary activism, uh, to talk about uh, why voice and story and representation not only are things that entertain us as readers, uh, as listeners, um, but can actually move your thinking, build your empathy, and provide representation. Um, and, you know, a lot of that really occurred for me, and I came to my story of writing as a, as a young person. Um, you know, as Lauren shared earlier, my involvement with the NAACP youth organization locally, and it was actually my experience having been a young person, being involved in organizations, and actually traveling nationally to national conversations with thousands of other youth who were involved in, and we didn't really call it activism, um, you know, back then, we just called it being involved. We, we, we called it caring. Um, we called it participating. Um, 
And it's a lot of those experiences that really bought, brought me to the point that, you know, in 2015 and 2016, when I was sort of witnessing young people on this campus and around the country really using their voice with assertiveness, um, mobilizing in a unified call of Black Lives Matter. And it was this, really this same call that I have felt my entire life, that my purpose, was to make significant change in the world. And um, as a young person, when I graduated, uh, I knew my purpose at the time, it wasn't going to be as expansive as thinking about the world in the way that, I, that I'm reaching now. It really was about if I'm organizing, if I'm act activating um, other people to be involved in care, if I'm thinking about access, if I'm thinking about diversity, there was a lot of paths that I could go. I could be in the grassroots way of like working with organizations um, or I could be working within a system and when I graduated I decided I wanted to work within a system and that system is a system of higher education um, but part of that system is um, some of the challenges of actually being able to have that activist spirit in a way that is complete freedom complete freedom, you can use your radical imagination, um, you can um, expand without any sort of context or impact in terms of at least mostly your, your, your uh, professional livelihood or how people view you, even if it is the right decision um, to make in this work. And as I was going through this experience and seeing what was happening um, with the growing call of Black Lives Matter, I started to think about my writing and what I could do with my writing. Um, and I felt compelled to write about justice, um, navigating being Black, uh, the generational impacts that have occurred, things that I did not feel that the media or my time in schooling um, as a young person, and I'm an adult, I'm grown, <laughs> um, didn't really allow me to have nuanced and complicated conversations about the intricacies of systemic racism in our country. Um, and this new generation coming in, the generation that, that I, as, as, a, as a professional and feeling hope, wanting to see them see things different. And they were having a very difficult time understanding why things were the way that they continued to be. And I tie that in with thinking about representation why we have not been able to move um, as far as we have as a country, even with all of the information and knowledge um, and possibilities to think about uh, where our country has been, where our country currently is, and where we actually want our country to be. Um, so, uh, so I tie this in and thinking about telling stories and storytelling and the purpose of storytelling and the threat of not being able to have expansive voices talk about history, the history. And if you have the power of story, I truly believe that you actually can reckon with your past and shape your future. You can learn from that. Um, that's also really what storytelling does. Uh, you know, it expands our understanding of the world. It provides empathy, reflection, uh, possibilities, as I said earlier, it writes the history if we actually allow more voices to share their perspective. Um, you, a, a perfect, there's many examples, but a perfect example that's very relevant to today, uh, to the second, is thinking about the work of The Handmaid's Tale, um, having been a, a, a novel turned into um, a series in a fictional and futuristic look at the world upon moral issues and the question um, of rights and who has rights. And we are seeing that um, the early remnants, right? If you sort of take away the, the futuristic components, uh, the impact of early Wade and what trail that does. And being able to tell stories, even if they seem impossible, even if they seem that um, that it's a world that we will never have, often there are still things that we can glean. Uh, we also see the value in being able to tell stories and histories and, and have it be um, embedded in our education when we look at how Germany looks at education and the importance that they have embedded in their society, embedded in their curriculum about reckoning with their history. 
so that what happened in Germany, what happened with the Nazis, what happened with the Holocaust never happens again. We see that as well in South Africa. Uh, when we look at uh, the, the education and the testimonies that occurred after um, the apartheid, uh, it was all about reconciliation, healing, and hope that we would change the way that we are as a society. Um, those are critical and important things for our entire world. The power of story provides us as individuals, um, as communities, uh, to really expand our mind and our experiences, often from education, but even just reading, listening to stories, being in conversation. Um, and I, I wanna talk about the power of stories and why representation is so important. Um, and a perfect example of that, that I, that I love so much is um, another author, uh, Chimamanda Adichie, who uh, talks about the danger of a single story. And I'm just going to play a single excerpt and I'm gonna actually just stop sharing my screen for a second because I wanna make sure that um, the sound works. But, um, uh, you know, the reason why I wanna share this particular um, story is because it connects to everything um, and the threat that's happening with single stories. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Yep. Apologies. Is that working for folks? I, I think you need to share your screen again, Kimberly. Oh, okay. I'll let me give me a second. So I don't have anyone helping me. Let me <laughs> let me share my screen. Give me a second. Okay, and I'm gonna just. Go back, and it's going to take a second to load. Unfortunately, um, the way my computer works, um, but I'll, I'll I'll keep going while that um, eventually loads on there. Um, but thinking about the power of story and the impact that it can have, and the impact even in the work that um, that I have been doing in talking about um, this is my America, is. Uh, what, when you don't display and talk about issues directly from the voices of those and those communities, you don't get an opportunity to really understand them. So let me, here's my next attempt at playing um, this. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new house boy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit and his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> she, 
She assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. So that is how to create a single story, show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. It is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is nkale. It's a noun that loosely translates to, to be greater than another. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of nkale. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. And, you know, when we think about the power of story and shaping our future, this is why literature and access to information are now under even more threat than we've seen in many years. Um, there are more stories and voices that have been expanded in, less, in the last five years and even the last two years that are specific to communities that haven't had an opportunity to be embraced by publishing. Um, those are BIPOC communities, LGBTQ um, plus communities, those with varying abilities, stories about pushing against systems and patriarchy, we are really starting to see a backlash. We are witnessing a battle for the old, a battle for power, policies that now are being threatened, not only with representation, but the broader community embracing an interest. Um, and, and I really attribute to many of the book banning and challenges that are occurring um, across the board. But when we specifically think about the works by Black authors, um, especially at the rise of, uh, you know, the 2020 um, greater expansion of the Black Lives Matter movement after the death of George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, is that the larger community, um, for whatever reason, finally started to awaken more so and saw their responsibility in not just being an observer of these systemic issues that are occurring in oppressions, but actually being a part of the solution. And part of that solution was unpacking and understanding privilege, whiteness, ableism, and building empathy. Um, and so much of the threat that we're seeing, the pushback, is around control of minds, of voices, and most importantly, vote. Um, so this descent to discourse of impacting the conversations that we have in our, as individuals, as families, in schools, in organizations, um, is a huge threat to those that don't actually want to see things change. They don't want the story, the histories to be told a certain way. Um, and I, I'm going to play, and this will be my last video that I'll, that I'll play, but I think it's helpful to give context to those of you that aren't familiar with the larger book banning and challenges that will take up most of the conversation that I'll lead you today. So I'm going to um, just play uh, this interview with Ta-Nehisi um, Coates, um, who was the author um, of Eight Years in Power, but also Between the World and Me, which was one of our U of O common reading books several years ago, where he actually came uh, to speak at Matthew, in Matthew Knight Arena. Author Tana Hasi Coates is joining us this hour with a discussion about an issue that we tend to associate with the past, the attempted banning of books here in America. These 10 books were the most, quote, challenged books last year. So that means someone attempted to get them banned, usually at a public library or school. Four of the 10 deal specifically with race and racism. 
Three were ultimately banned in some communities. For three years in a row, the most challenged book has been banned for LGBTQIA plus content. In 2020, one of the banned books was Between the World and Me, and that's why ta Coates is here for this discussion. He's also part of an event this week with the authors of several other banned works, including Ibram X. Kendi and Nicole Hannah-Jones. ta Coates, we're gonna move on from football and talk about books. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's look at this. Four of the top 10 books were banned because of, it's called anti-black racism. Is that a coincidence to you? What do you make of that? No, I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence yeah. at all. Um, I think for most of American history, uh, African-American authors have not had the purchase uh, on the American conscience that they have right now. We've always talked among ourselves. Uh, mostly the dialogue in terms of books has been amongst ourselves. You're at a moment where, you know, people like Ibram Kendi, people like Nicole Hannah-Jones, they're reaching a lot of people. Ibram sells a lot of books. The 1619 Project was seen by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So this is really about white people and particularly white children now being exposed to ideas that I think previously were, were segregated, frankly. So does it make parents and teachers uncomfortable? Is that, why do you think it's happening? I don't know that it even makes parents and teachers uncomfortable. I think it makes um, certain politicians in our system uncomfortable. Um, the 1619 Project was cited in an uh, executive order. Mm -hmm. um, there are laws, for instance, passed in Texas that specifically mention this work. Yep. So this is the state. This isn't just, you know, Local I don't want, exactly. I don't want my kid reading this. This is actually state action uh, banning some of this work. What are the stakes in this fight? Um, I think it's the political imagination, um, which is a big term. But uh, we think about going into the voting booth, you know, to make choices about what policies, what politicians we want. But you can't understand, for instance, why healthcare should be a human right. If you don't understand history, if you don't understand uh, uh, the context in which things happen, if you can't put your, yourself in the shoes of somebody that doesn't have health care, that's what books do. They expand the political imagination. They let you know what you're actually voting for in the first place. I want to get back to your book, Between the World and Me, which is about being black in America. It was challenged and banned. What was your reaction to that when you heard the news? Well, actually, I just heard this today. <laughs> in fact, just in fact, when we were talking in the green room, I mean, obviously I've known for years that it's been banned, for instance, in prisons. You know, and I get occasional things about it being banned in schools. But the big one I actually heard about was we were eight years in power. But there was a teacher down in, in uh, Tennessee, Matt Hahn, who was fired for teaching uh, an essay in, in, in there. And um, that's just part of a wave that is happening. You know, it is, you know, state legal action to, you know, really prevent certain ideas from being into, you know, uh, entering into the mainstream conversation. But I like Nate's question, though, because what is your reaction? Here you have this best-selling book yeah. that has been really widely acclaimed right. and well, very well received. You hear that your work is being banned. Um, so I'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Between the world, we sold a lot of books. I'm okay. I'm still getting my royalty checks. Um, I'm sorry for kids. You know, one of the things I was saying, you know, back when we were talking before is um, my consciousness and my sense of the world was not just formed by black authors and by authors who validated my world, but by authors who challenged. You know what I mean? Authors, in fact, who at this very day, I will tell you, were cold racist. But I needed to know. I needed to know what the world is. And so when you start saying to a kid or your kids, I only want you to read things that validate my point of view, that's no longer education, that's indoctrination. But I'm trying to thing. figure out, ta -Nehisi, why your book was banned. Do you know? Have you been given a reason about why the book was banned? I have to be honest, I have not interrogated it too much. But um, if I had to guess, I yes. think it goes back to what we were saying at the top. To this point about education versus indoctrination, I think it's important to point out that people on the right, politicians would say they're the ones being canceled and shut out. They're not included in the conversation. And when you're endorsing a wide range of ideas, you're saying in an educational... So that's just a little bit about what is happening for those of you that might not be aware. And, um, you know, Tanisi Coates was talking about just finding out that his that his book was either challenged or banned, knowing that it has happened specifically, but not really knowing the current state. And that is the reality of many books that are being challenged, uh, which means that there's a question being called at either a parent or um, to a school or a library about a particular text or novel or pieces of work. 
um, even at the state level. And the actual ban is the actual pulling of those books so that they're not there. And so I, I've been aware of, of my, my book, but this is my America. And for, for most of you probably know, but you might not. Um, my work, it's about a 17 year old black girl whose father has been wrongfully incarcerated um, and sentenced to the death sentence. Um, and it's a story where she really resolves to try to fight by writing letters to Innocence X, which is an organization really giving homage to the Equal Justice Initiative and the Innocence Project who work to free um, and reevaluate cases where there might have been um, extreme charges, unfair charges, or even an unwrongful um, conviction associated with it in a sentence to the death penalty. Um, and, and my work deals uh, uh, tangentially in some ways related to, the, to police brutality, but really looking at the larger systemic issues of our criminal justice system. Um, but if you boil the story down uh, to what it is, if you take away race, it's a story about someone who was convicted for something they didn't do. There should be nothing really controversial about that. And so after, you know, I was, um, you know, pulling my, my research and, and information that I wanted to share as part of this conversation today, uh, looking at myself, because I knew that um, I, I, I knew of one county um, that, that um, has pulled my book uh, from, from their schools um, in Pennsylvania. And I, Google my name, Danny Kim Johnson, this is my America, um, March through April, and found I had no idea that I that there were AP series articles about um, my book being listed in some of those. And that's what's happened secretly, is that you don't even know that your book is being challenged, or you don't even know that books are being pulled and curated quietly um, because they don't want to cause any sort of um, tension in communities if they're aware that certain things are happening. Um, there are principals who have been fighting against this, who have been fired in certain states because of a lot of teachers who've been fired um, because they have, you know, not pulled um, text in ways that, um, that they were sort of expected to. Um, and what are these books, right? So what are, and, um, you know, book banning challenges, this isn't new. This is not a new thing. Um, they are happening quietly, they're happening loudly for some books, but it's not new. But there's a certain flavor that's different about the banning that are that is occurring. Uh, if you look at pre-2020, um, uh, prior to the pandemic, 2019, the number of challenges that were occurring had no particular trend. Uh, they were not rallying through states. There was not legislation being built. Um, there were maybe parents sharing concern of maybe a dozen or so, along with the typical books that were challenged. In 2021, there were 729 challenges, according, according to the American Library Association, associated with um, almost 1,600 individual books alone. And some of them are considered books that have been classics that have always been sort of um, concern, and others are specifically of a particular right flavor and variety, right? And and you should know what those are, and and I'll highlight what some of those are. But I do want to go to um, why banning isn't isn't new. It's not a new thing. If we look at Nazi Germany, where bonfires for books were being um, created, that's a part of the story. You get rid of the history. Um, you get rid of the education and the language. Um, that's not new. Um, when, we, when we look at the variety of, of titles that I shared uh, when I, I'm talking about the, you know, almost 1600, when we break them down, a majority of those are books written and or about communities of marginalized identities communities that have not been in power. Um, why is that, right? Go back to what I was talking about earlier, about what's happening um, with the rise of consciousness, with the rise of LGBTQ plus um, rights in our country. We're seeing states, we're seeing uh, political affiliations set up identity politics um, and be very upset about how they feel that their children who are not of those identities might feel bad 
in the classroom when they're reading about these things without acknowledging the experiences of those populations whose vo voices have been silent. It's all about power. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, this isn't new. Censorship, banning, challenges, this isn't new. We can tie it to just the element of literacy, education. Um, they're, they're, they're not new topics. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley was the first known Black writer to have a book of poetry published in the 1700s. Um, and she was enslaved. Uh, she almost, and this was almost 250 years ago. Um, she was enslaved at seven years old, where she was br brought directly from a slave ship. And she was later caught writing on a wall with chalk, which is something that she wasn't supposed to do because she wasn't supposed to know how to read and write because it was illegal uh, in order to do that. Um, but the family didn't admonish her. They allowed her to write and allowed her to travel to England where she actually got her book published. And upon her return to America is actually where she earned her freedom. And it wasn't until 75 years later that another sort of uh, large range of narratives, of slave narratives, um, were published, um, even during the time of enslavement. And, and one of those is Frederick Douglass, which was 177 years ago. And if you just imagine the kinds of stories and voices and empathy that could have been built, the humanization of a people that were enslaved without the ability of not only freedom, but to write, to educate themselves, and to tell their stories, it's easier to control. It's easier to sort of put people on the outside because you could create your own propaganda of the reasons why one population, one community, one identity is less than the other. That is the power of story and who controls the story. During the time period of slavery, there were 6,000 narratives written by African-American slaves published between 1700 and 1950. Could you imagine if there was the freedom earlier uh, during that time period and it wasn't illegal to write and read and tell their stories? Um, and this is all about representation. Um, uh, there's a, sorry, my computer's acting funny. Um, you know, there's a very common phrase in the young adult community, um, and that's young adult authors and kid lit authors uh, who talk about um, mirrors and sliding glass doors and windows and what that actual representation does, um, as, especially at a very young age where it allows you um, growing up to see yourself and only see yourself, but see others see others that it's a, it's possible, things are possible, that you can be the hero in your story, that you can be the doctor and the lawyer and the teacher um, in, in all of those spaces. Um, and to not have that representation uh, is a threat um, to our growth. Uh, there's just a, a little bit more that I, that I think is just very interesting things in terms of when we think about the context of young minds, which is the space that, that I work in um, in my writing. Um, a, a space that I'm fighting uh, to keep myself in now that I sort of grasp myself in that space is just to get a better understanding about why it is so important to actually have representation. And as we sort of inch higher um, in some representation, how it's really not enough. Um, if you look at the Black representation in the publishing industry, um, this is some data from 2018 that shows how few the percentage of the entire publishing industry from those that are um, selecting what books, purchasing um, the rights for books, going to an executive committee, making decisions, and then eventually marketing and editing that it's, um, the industry is so small. And if we look at the, the diversity in children's book, there are more books about animals than there are books about and by people of color. 
Um, and I, that this graphic to me is um, has always been one of my favorites because it just shows how hard it is to find yourself in um, and, and be represented and the kinds of impacts that it actually can have. Um, and that's sort of where I've come from in uh, my own value that I have found in my writing and writing stories of resistance. Um, and I, I wrote a piece uh, for Blavity as an op-ed that, um, that I think really provides the context that I'm hoping to leave this conversation in how do we fight against um, what is currently occurring and who needs to be involved in it? Because I, I wholeheartedly believe that we can't reckon with race, we can't reckon with bias, we can't actually make change, uh, we can't fight against uh, policies and legislation and the control taking away the freedom of, of schools and teachers to educate um, young people if we actually don't have everyone in. And so, you know, I, I wrote this op-ed um, right before my, my book published in July of 2020. Um, the, 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 the protests were very heavy around the country, uh, most, most focused on um, uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the sort of larger things that were sort of happening, all the other um, people who've been impacted. Um, and, and I'm going to read a, a, a piece um, of this story called We Are Done Dying. Um, and and, and it, it goes like this, that, you know, over the past six years, cell phone video footage has provided overwhelming evidence of the lived experiences of Black Americans. Yet the footage also documents what so many of us have already known. Cries of injustice continue to be ignored. Our tainted model of a jury system extends to our media, which details accounts that too often sit on the side of the white supremacy that is embedded in our society. The victims become the ones on trial of public opinion and white people's perceptions of what is innocence and guilt. And um, a, a little bit more into um, to my writing that, uh, despite the progress made during the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was not developed to address the failures of state violence. The Civil Rights Act of 1871 was later enhanced by the updated Section 1983, which prohibits violation of a per person's rights by excessive force, yet police brutality persists unchecked. Since slave ships arrived in 1619, our society has abandoned the idea of equal justice for Black Americans. Our country has 400 years of history to resolve, from enslavement, lynching, Jim Crow, civil rights, mass incarceration, redlining, health disparities, and the physical and psychological and volatile nature of racism. And white Americans have mostly severed themselves, mostly, <laughs> from the responsibility of this bloody history, which has allowed white supremacy not only to continue, but to rise and present itself boldly around the country over the last four years. Um, and so our country's bloodstream history of violence against people of color will continue to taint our nation's morality until it is addressed. The generational trauma of violence is unacceptable. We are done dying done smiling and code switching to disarm fear, done being held responsible for actions harming the black community, done with unfair sentencing, done with being followed, done with white vigilante behavior, done with the lack of acknowledgement and restitution from enslavement to unequal pay, done with unfair school systems, done with home loans at higher rates and red line neighborhoods, done with rules that don't apply to white America, uh, don't help the ill, don't sell cigarettes, don't talk back, don't walk in your neighborhood, don't report police, don't lie down, don't barbecue, don't sleep, don't play, don't swim, don't go to a pool party, don't play your music, don't run for your life, don't jog. We are done. We can no longer let America sit by idly ignoring justice and neither can you. There is a call here. Um, and when we think about books and we think about stories, often we think it's, oh, that's terrible that that's happening in that other way. But we have to be in a place where we have to realize how can we influence, how can we make change? Um, and I believe it's the power of story because when you have story and you have empathy and you have connection, you have a place to begin. Um, and 
And we do this in story, and I'm going to give an example from, from my work about how can you sort of take these things that are happening in the world um, that are emotional and painful um, and traumatic and systemic um, and tell a story um, that, that, that is in fiction but bleeds so true. Um, and there's a scene in, in my novel on page 297 that, that I'll read that I, I'd love to pull and, and always show because it really takes a lot of history and all of what I said, and I, and I actually edited that down so much just so that we would take so much time reading uh, my, my op-ed that I wrote. Um, so how do you tell it in a story? So this is from a character named Jamal in my book. Uh, this is by America, who is um, suspected of killing a local white girl. Um, and his father is, is the father who has been wrongfully incarcerated. Um, and Tracy, who is the main character in this story, um, is interacting with her brother after a long sort of um, um, break that they've had. And so this is Jamal. Nah, you don't hear me see all these books. Jamal points around to the scattered books I hadn't noticed are from the collections we rotated in and out to Daddy. W.E.B. Du Bois, James Baldwin, Thurgood Marshall, Michelle Alexander, Tanahisi Coates, that a week's worth of newspapers. They all say the same thing over and over again. It doesn't matter when they were written. The laws might change. The systems might look different. All these books say what the problem is. Working 10 times harder to get half. Seems to me all the blood that's been spoiled ain't our debt, but we pay it over and over again. And the world acts like there's something wrong with us. They hate us so damn much. Jamal's voice is cracking. Desperate words that have been suffocating him. 400 years and we still ain't American to them, T. All that blood, we built America. Black labor built the greatest nation in the world for free. They ripped us from our family then and they do it again with new laws, disguises change. I'll be in prison doing that labor for free. Um, and that's just a sample. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll move to questions really uh, right after this. But the other thing that I wanna say about representation and story, it's not just about writing about issues like I like, I like to write about, which are real life issues of um, systemic issues in our country, but it's also about representation of seeing other people in fantasy, seeing other communities who the story isn't, the core about their identity and their experiences of bias, but about living. Or if it is, that there's so much more to their story. And so I love just showing, these are just some young adult pieces that um, have been my favorite come out that talk about different issues um, that can make um, the, the, the impact in someone's life, especially as a young person reading about different people that so many of us who may be a little older, um, like me, didn't have an opportunity to do. So thank you so much for your time. I'm just going to link, um, these are some resources for those of you that want to take action or are aware of um, books and challenges that are occurring. My publisher, Penguin Random House, has a resource page. It's incredible. It has all kinds of links and resources. Um, for what to do as a parent, as a student, as a librarian, as a community member, um, if you want to fight against uh, the book bans and challenges that are occurring. Um, so I am looking forward to answering any questions that actually might be out there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. That was fantastic. Um, we don't currently have any questions. So I want to remind everyone that if you have a question for Kim, you can put it in the chat, you can put it in the Q&A. If you're joining us via the live stream on Facebook, you can ask it there in the comments and we will get to those and share them. Um, Off the camera. <laughs> no problem. And that link that you had on your last slide, would you be willing at some point to drop that into yeah. the chat here? Um, and that was actually one of the questions that I was going to kick us off with was um, whether you had seen or had any experience with sort of the publishing industry really helping to step up and push back against some of these book bans. Um, so, yeah. I mean, obviously you have that link, but if... if I do, but I'll, I will just say that um, it wasn't like it was some, it, it was great to see but it wasn't like my publisher or other publishers actually had communicated with authors. For many authors, we actually felt like we were alone. 
um, we didn't because what happened with me um, is that I was getting tagged on social media of um, of organizations and people who were trying to support my book and they wanted to tag me to let me know that this was happening. But the challenge with that is that in a social media front is that when you respond to those things, you actually um, have targeted um, hateful um, communications and, and people who, who then um, attack you and, and target you. And, and I'm not interested in engaging in that way. I wanna write my books to reach young people. I don't wanna fight with um, eggheads on Twitter <laughs> that, that, don't, <laughs> that have zero followers um, who, who just have a very hateful spirit about them. But for, for a very long time, many authors felt isolated alone. And I was thrilled when I saw what um, Penguin Random House um, has done with partnering with PEN America, uh, who are doing a lot of advocacy and their resources are, are incredible. Thank you. So we have had a few questions come in. Um, what would you say to other authors regarding how to treat representation in their works? You know, I, I think you have to read widely. And I think it's really important that even if you're of that sort of, uh, if there's a, if you have a book that is um, either dealing with a particular topic that, um, you know, it doesn't have a lot of representation or has a, a main character or other support characters in the story um, that have uh, historically underrepresented um, communities is that you have to read widely and read from authors of that identity. Because the mistake that I see all the time is that people will take a story that they've read, that they've read and not really recognized um, that maybe those voices that were telling these stories um, actually were interpretations of things that they've seen and actually not lived experiences. And I think that that's important to do that and question yourself. Um, and then to really think about why you're writing what you're writing and is it your positionality to actually tell that story or are there uh, other ways that you can sort of focus the angle of your story um, because there are some spaces that I think it's critically important that we actually hear directly from certain communities. I think specifically of, of um, the trans community um, and how silenced um, their community has been for so long. Um, we want to be allies, we want to support, we, we want to get those voices out, um, but there has to be a space for them to be able to tell their stories. And so I, I think being very careful about that and reading up and what's happening in the industry, reading directly from authors, paying attention um, to those nuances that are incredibly important before you make any decisions to sort of hop in and, and, and start writing. Thank you. Um, someone is asking kind of what you have that keeps you going um, when perhaps life or your writing gets hard. Um, I always have had a just get it done kind of attitude and push through and knowing that um, that I will get through, I'll get on the other side of it. And, and, and that's just been since I was young. It's, it's sort of always been that way. But I think it's so important to identify something. And for me, it's something that's bigger than myself. Um, and for me, it's I've always, uh, it's, it's that sort of purpose that derives who I am and allows me to find value in the work I'm doing and not value in how other people sort of perceive me and, and think about me because it's a really dangerous place to be in because um, no one else knows your journey and, and what you're sort of purposed in, <laughs> to do, especially if you're a spiritual person. No one knows what your, um, your journey is supposed to be. And it's very easy to come off track if you pay attention to that. And so the thing that keeps me going are my kids, um, you know, them being excited about, about my work, um, knowing I'm going to be reaching young people, knowing it just, it's a, it feels so cathartic to actually write about this stuff. But there's so many people who, um, especially with the, with the issues I write about, there are many authors who don't want to touch it. <laughs> they don't, they definitely do not want to touch it. They want to write about love and romance and, 
aliens fighting each other and, you know, all these other kinds of things because it allows, like, you to have an excitement in a different kind of way. And for me, I actually find that it's much more cathartic. And I think that that comes from being an early activist and organizer. I'm in the work. So when I'm writing, I'm not looking for an escape. I'm in the work. I want to be in the work. And that's very driving for me and works for me. So you shared the, the link for how people could um, take some action in regards to the books that are being banned. But we have someone who is asking if you have any suggestions that book readers, um, for actions that book readers could take to get more of these stories told. So you showed the graphic that shows um, the representation in children's stories. And I'm sure there's a similar one out there for young adult and adult mm -hmm. books as well. Um, so do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I, the, the biggest thing, I mean, there's, there's often a gap that, that people are like, well, I want, even if you're not that of identity, you're like, well, then I, let me write more books about these communities. And that's not, that's not the answer. <laughs> the, the answer is publishing is a business. It's not a nonprofit. Um, the market drives where stories go. When vampires are popular, lots of books about vampires came. <laughs> when, when, when Harry Potter and magic and those kinds of things are popular, more books um, were, were sold and written about that. Um, and for so long, many books uh, from underrepresented communities weren't purchased because a lot of publishers felt like they already had that one publisher. Um, they already had that, that sort of one book that was about that one particular issue without recognizing there's all kinds of princess stories, right? There's, there's hundreds of princess stories, but why is it an issue if there's one um, Asian princess story and we can't have another? And so the biggest thing a reader can do is read, purchase, share, review books, go to the library, call the library, um, uh, they actually even have it online where you actually can ask for books before they come out because if the industry sees that there's an interest in reading those books, it helps drive a confidence uh, in the market that these books are important and we need to get it out there. And it, to take away, you know, some of the, the faux pas that were there of if you have a book like mine, which has a, a, a black young teenager on the cover, um, to make the assumption that someone who is not Black wouldn't want to read that, you got to break that cycle of, you know, like, oh, my goodness, you love thrillers? You should read this book. <laughs> oh, you, you know, you, this, is, this is moving. You should read that. And I, and I think that that goes across the board with all levels of books of doing that. Um, it doesn't have to cost money. A library is a, an amazing place to be able to do that. Book clubs. Um, spreading the word, again, reviews, reviews, like if you read a book, like, put it on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Goodreads, Target, you know, <laughs> wherever you've got that, um, got that book, it really, really does help. So I'm going to do a shameless plug for your book and tell everyone <laughs> watching that they should go buy a copy of This Is My America and then go and do an online review for your book. Um, and when I was looking up um, your bio in order to do your introduction this evening, I did notice that I believe you have another book that's slated to come out. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, I do. I have a book. It's called Invisible Sun. Um, it comes out in winter of 2023. Uh, it's about a 17-year-old uh, Black boy living in Portland during the pandemic. It deals with the juvenile justice system. Um, it deals with um, uh, the sense of a more reluctant activist um, who really doesn't want to do that work. So um, yeah, I'm really excited for that, uh, for that to come out. And then in 2024, I have a young adult historical novel set in 1954 um, that deals with um, white passing, uh, redlining in, in certain communities and um, discrimination laws around um, modern um, early American suburbia. And remember to everyone tuning in that you can go and request those books in advance at your library as we just learned. I did not know that. So mm -hmm. I hope that someone else now knows that as well. Um, we have time just for one more um, comment. 
And we have someone asking about it, and I was curious too. I had seen um, last year that HBO Max was going to be picking up This Is My America. Um, is that still a work in progress? Is that coming soon? Yeah, so uh, you know they're working on the uh, pilot, the script for the pilot, and HBO Max is still excited. <laughs> <laughs> about um, about this being a series, and you know, it's it's one of those that you never know what happens with the industry. But you know, the goal with my the production company that I'm working with is that the season one would be the book, and then the following seasons would be different elements and angles and um, um, sort of journeys that um, the characters in the stories would, would be involved in and new cases. So. Um, so I'm, I'm still, you know, things are still going good with that. <laughs> well, that's very exciting. I don't know how you find time to sleep with everything <laughs> that you do. It's impressive and amazing. Um, thank you so much again for talking with us this evening. Um, I really enjoyed it. I know that everyone who tuned in did as well. We can imagine everyone clapping right now. <laughs> um, so, and I just want to remind everyone, we are taking a break from Ideas on Tap for the summer. The best way to know what's happening with the museum is to follow us on social media um, or check out our website. And you can learn all about upcoming programs that the museum has um, for everyone from youth and families up through adults. So um, I hope everyone has a enjoyable summer um, and thank you again. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.